When it comes to electric vehicles like the 2012 Fisker Karma, there are basically two types of people. You've got the tree huggers on one side who think that electric vehicles are the solution to everything from global warming to leprosy. And then you've got the haters, people who think it's all just a big liberal conspiracy and electric vehicles create more problems than they solve. Well, as Agent Mulder would say, the truth is out there. So why don't we find out if the Fisker Karma is a green machine or not? And specifically, I want to know if driving this around is eco-friendly here in the state of Texas. As of January 2012, Texas's electrical generation looked like this. We get 34% of our electricity from coal, 42% from natural gas, 12% from nuclear, 11% from wind, and less than 1% from hydroelectric and other. Now, burning fossil fuels releases all sorts of pollutants, but carbon dioxide is the one that most people focus on, and coal is the worst offender of CO2 emissions. A modern coal-fired power plant releases 1,000 grams of CO2 per kilowatt generated. A natural gas-powered generating station, on the other hand, releases an average of 430 grams of CO2 per kilowatt. And due to some statistical oddities, which I won't go into here, nuclear, wind, and hydroelectric each have trace amounts of CO2, which combine to account for only 20 grams per kilowatt total. So we know where Texas gets its power from, and we know how much CO2 is emitted by each of those sources. Therefore, we can calculate that here in Texas, one kilowatt of electricity produces 527.7 grams of CO2. However, to be fair, we have to take into account another variable, and that variable is transmission loss. On average, 10% of the electricity that leaves the power station is lost due to resistance in the power lines. So every one kilowatt generated will only result in 0.9 kilowatts delivered to your house. Therefore, the adjusted CO2 footprint for one kilowatt of electricity here in Texas is 579 grams. Well, the tree huggers will probably turn right around and say, hey, pumping oil out of the ground, refining it, transporting the gasoline to your gas station, all that uses energy as well. Now, that's true. But then the haters are going to come right back and they're going to say, hey, pumping natural gas, mining coal, delivering the gas and the coal to the power plant, that also uses up a lot of energy. And that's all true, but you know what? As far as I'm concerned, the two of those things cancel each other out. It's a wash, so we're not going to include it in our calculations. Without boring you with all the details, suffice to say that it takes 18.8 kilowatts of electricity to fully charge the Karma's battery. A fully charged battery gives me about 42 miles of range in this car. Now, sometimes I get a little more, sometimes I get a little less, but 42 is a pretty good average to work from. I went ahead and I picked an array of different vehicles to compare against, and the first one we'll want to look at is the 2012 Prius C, which gets 53 mpg. And this beats the Karma by a landslide with only 167 grams of CO2 per mile compared to the Karma's 260. But that's not really a fair comparison, is it? I mean, we're comparing a beautiful luxury sports sedan with an ugly, slow, hippie mobile that probably smells like tofu and pot. The car which is really the best apples to apples comparison is the Porsche Panamera. The Panamera gets a combined MPG of 21, and as you can see, it generates 422 grams of CO2 per mile, which is way more than the Karma. The Lexus GS350 at 23 mpg isn't much better. It generates 385 grams of CO2. If, however, we pick a 37 mile per gallon eco box like the Scion IQ, then it's almost a tie with the Karma. 240 grams versus the Karma's 260 grams. Yeah, technically the Karma loses in this matchup, but, you know, if you're over 30 years old and you're driving a Scion IQ, well, Who's really the loser here? Finally, I went ahead and I picked a car that I really like, which is the Hyundai Sonata. This car gets 28 mpg. And I spent 
I don't know, I think it was three days driving one of these a few years back. And I've got to say that this is actually a really, really good car. But as good as it is, it still has a significantly larger CO2 footprint than the Karma. So what about cost? Electric vehicles are supposed to cost less to operate than gas vehicles, right? Well, let's do the math on that. Now, Austin Energy recently raised their electric rates for the first time in something like 18 years. And the most expensive rate that they have for residential electricity is 11.4 cents per kilowatt hour. Now, that's the top rate. That's the summer rate, and that's after you've already passed the 2,500 kilowatt threshold. It basically means that in the winter, your rate will probably be half that. But for our calculations, we're going to go ahead and use the worst case scenario, which is 11.4 cents per kilowatt. We know from earlier that it takes about 18.8 .8 kilowatts to charge the Karma. Therefore, it costs about $2.14 to fully charge the battery. And remember, that's worst case scenario. A gallon of super unleaded gas here in Austin currently costs about $3.62. So that gives us this chart. The Karma only costs about five cents in electricity per mile to operate, which is less than any of these other cars in the list, including the Prius. It's around three times less expensive than the Porsche or the Lexus or the Hyundai. However, that's not the full story. There is one other very important variable that we have to take into consideration, and that's the battery itself. The battery in any electric vehicle is a consumable item. Fisker claims that the battery in this car is good for about 10 years or 100,000 miles. So when this battery is due to be replaced, how much is it going to cost to replace it? Well, if you listen to the experts and their projections, then by the year 2020, a new Karma battery should cost around $4,000. Well, $4,000 divided by 100,000 miles equals four cents per mile. So the true cost of driving a Fisker Karma is not just the five cents in electricity per mile, it's five cents plus four cents in battery depreciation. That gives you a total of nine cents per mile. So now the Prius actually costs less per mile to drive than the Karma. However, the Karma is still more economically feasible than any of the other cars in this comparison. As car batteries age, they lose their capacity. And Fisker claims that the battery in the Fisker Karma will still have 80% of its original capacity after 100,000 miles or 10 years. Now, what that means is that instead of getting 42 miles per charge like I currently do, over time, that's going to start to shift towards around 34 miles per charge. Now, if you do the math, it ends up that over time, that's going to add one penny per mile to the cost of operating the car. That's really not a big deal when you consider how much gas prices fluctuate. You know, a gas car cost per mile is going to fluctuate much more than that, not just over 10 years, but almost day to day. Now, what does make a bigger difference, at least potentially, is the CO2 footprint of this car as the battery ages. Over the course of 10 years, the carbon footprint is going to go from 260 to 324 grams per mile. But this chart really isn't accurate because in 10 years, Texas will have continued to shift farther away from coal and more towards cleaner sources of power. Now it's hard to say for sure, but odds are that as the battery's carbon footprint increases over time, the electric company's carbon footprint will decrease over time and thus they cancel each other out. Now it's also important to remember that gas powered cars get dirtier with age as their emission control systems start to break down. So you could argue that as electric vehicles get older, they get cleaner and as a Prius gets older, it gets dirtier. The bottom line is this. The Fisker Karma has a smaller carbon footprint than a gas-powered car as long as the gas-powered car gets worse than 36 mpg. If the gas-powered car gets more than 36 mpg, then the gas-powered car has a smaller carbon footprint than the Karma. So both the tree huggers are right 
and the haters are right. It really just depends on what you compare it against. And it also depends on where you live. Now, let's take China for example. In China, they get 85% of their electricity from fossil fuels. 95% of that is from coal, and it's dirty coal, very dirty coal. You don't want to be charging electric vehicles in China. Bad idea. Similarly, in West Virginia, they get 96% of their electricity from coal. You probably don't want to be recharging one of these in West Virginia. On the other hand, California, less than 2% of their electricity from coal, and they get 15% from renewable sources. So sure, in California, it's a good idea to have an electric vehicle. Now for me here in Texas, it actually doesn't matter. Well, at least it won't matter in a few weeks because in a couple of weeks, I'm getting solar panels put on my roof, which should give me about 28 kilowatts of electricity per day. My karma here on average, I really only need about eight, maybe 10 kilowatts to top it off every day. So I'll be generating for free much more electricity than I need to just recharge the car. And yes, I do typically recharge my car during the middle of the day. It's usually after I get back from lunch. I very rarely ever need to recharge this at night. So my Karma's carbon footprint is going to be very, very close to zero. Just as there are haters of electric vehicles, there are haters of solar power. Haters will claim that it takes a huge amount of electricity to manufacture a solar panel. And this is true. But then again, it takes a huge amount of energy to make the cement and the steel that goes into a traditional power plant. So this argument is once again a bit of a wash. I mean, over their lifetime, solar panels offset about nine times as much CO2 as is produced while making them. Plus, in 15 years, nobody's going to care about the CO2 that was released last week during the manufacturing of the solar panel. There are also misinformed people out there who are convinced that lithium ion batteries are some sort of radioactive toxic brick that will have to be treated like nuclear waste when they're used up. Well, the US government classifies lithium ion batteries as non-hazardous waste, which is safe for disposal in the normal municipal waste system. It's the old lead acid and nickel batteries that are toxic. Lithium's not really, and they're almost entirely recyclable. That being said, Remember that even after 100,000 miles, the Karma's battery still has 80% of its capacity, so it can be repurposed for other things like grid storage. It doesn't have to be thrown away or recycled, even though it's no longer good enough for automotive use. I've tried my best to present complete and accurate information, but even if my mathematical computations are totally off, and even if all of my sources of information are just bogus, well, at the end of the day, EVs are zero emission vehicles where you drive them. I mean, I would much rather have a toxic gas cloud over some power plant out in the middle of nowhere than over my house. And additionally, I'd much rather be sending my hard earned money to a coal miner in West Virginia than to some oil chic out in Saudi Arabia.